There we are, 207 in your Heavenly Highway hymn book. In your Heavenly Highway hymn book, page 207. 207. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see. stand tonight we'll open service in prayer and after we get done with prayer well we'll have a time of shaking hands and then we'll come back and sing another song heavenly father we're so grateful tonight lord for the promise of heaven that you've given us and lord we thank you heavenly father for these folks who've come by this evening pray that you'll be at the evening prayer service lord and be at the preaching of your word tonight and lord be with our Young people, Lord, that are in Alaska, we just pray, God, that your hand and protection be upon them, Lord, that they would honor you uh, through everything that they do, Lord, and, Lord, that you would just protect them, Heavenly Father, and, Lord, bring them home safely, Lord, when the time comes. Lord, we love you, and we thank you tonight for all you've done. What a blessing it is, Lord, to be able to pray to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn around and welcome, folks, to church tonight. Bless you so much. Looks to page number 59 tonight. Page number 59. I feel like traveling on. Page number 59. <coughs> page number 59. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Nor pain nor death can enter. I feel like traveling on I feel like traveling 
thank you tonight. Tonight, and after that, we'll have our prayer meeting time, and uh, so be ready for that. Let's jump in and preach tonight, Brother Jason. Good evening. It's good to be here tonight. <clears throat> I want to look tonight um, at a Spanish word. I was doing my studying yesterday and came across a Spanish word, and so y'all can. Learn a little bit of Spanish tonight. That'll be good, won't it? See. Si. And it uh, actually, um, I, I use a language app for some of my learning. And it's kind of interesting. But a word came up that is one that every one of us has to deal with uh, in life. And you'll like this one because uh, it's, it's easy for you to learn because it's the same word in Spanish and English. And it's the word carnality. <laughs> it's a bit of a tough word. But I meant you'd like it as far as being easy to learn. Uh, but the flesh, carnality has to do with the flesh. It's something every one of us has to learn to deal with as Christians is this thing of carnality. So in Spanish, they pronounce it a little bit different, and uh, but it's the same. Uh, it comes from the same root uh, in Latin as what we use in English, but it's the Latin word of caro, C-A-R-O, and it means flesh. And in English, we have several different words that kind of come from this came, uh, same uh, root of caro, but words like carnal, carnage, <laughs> that's what your flesh will lead to, carnage, carnival, carnivore, carnation, from the color of flesh is the name of the flowers, carnation, but these all de derive from the Latin word for flesh or Carnal, And so that's the word we want to look at tonight. Before we go any further, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the privilege you give us to gather together in your house tonight. And what a great opportunity to be able to proclaim your word. And Lord, I thank you that when we look at a subject like our filthy flesh, that we can look at your word and gain hope for there's a better day that's coming. And I thank you for the victory you give us through Christ. Thank you for giving us your word so we can know the truth and that the truth will make us free. And so tonight I ask that you please would speak to our hearts. Please um, calm um, my soul tonight. I pray you give me the words to say, the power to deliver the message, and may it touch the hearts of your people. So help us now meet with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Carnality. Carnality. The words carnal and carnally are used 15 different times in your Bible. We find it scattered throughout the Old Testament in three different places. The book of Leviticus, chapter 18, and verse number 20 says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. Next time you find it, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 20. And whosoever lieth carnally with a woman that is a bondmaid betrothed to an husband and not at all redeemed nor freedom given her, she shall be scourged. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. Third time we find carnally in the Old Testament is Numbers 5.13. And... And a man lie carnally, uh, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. And so we, this is verse Brother Reg was just preaching on this chapter just um, a couple weeks ago, and uh, but these are the only three times you find the word carnally, or a derivative of carnal in the Old Testament, and each time you find this in the Old Testament. It 
is used very specifically in these examples applying to the physical relation of a man and a woman. And also, it all three times is a man and woman outside of marriage. And you contrast that with the fact that God uses the word no and new to describe the relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, whenever it's inside of marriage in the Old Testament. But every time you find carnally, it is outside the confines of marriage. It is used when it is sin. Carnal versus no when it comes to the confines of marriage. And when you look at the word no, that's the root of another word in English called knowledge. And what's the beginning of knowledge? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom as well. But when we look at the flesh inside of marriage, and according to the bounds that God gives, it can be a good thing, but outside of the bounds of marriage, it's always sinful. In the New Testament... We find the word carnal and carnally used 12 more times. Romans chapter 7 verse 14 is the first time we see it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So here is Paul speaking of carnality. And he said, I am carnal, sold under sin. I had grand hopes as a Christian that as I got older, maybe uh, I could be a little better Christian. That maybe with some practice and some discipline <laughs> be, might get a little bit better. Uh, any of you that have been around very long have learned this old flesh doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better. And Paul realized that as well. And next time we see carnal in the New Testament is Romans 8, verse 6 and 7. Where the Bible says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Again, Romans 15, verse 27. It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So we find another way that the word carnal is used in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4 says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? First Corinthians 9.11 If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things? Second Corinthians 10.3 and 4 For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hebrews 7.16, who was made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. This is speaking of, um, my goodness, my mind went plumb plum blank here. Uh, back in the Old Testament, now i got to look up his name. This is Genesis chapter 14. My brain isn't even working here. Genesis 14. Let me see. This was a, uh, a man, uh, Melchizedek. Speaking of Melchizedek, the Bible says, who is made not, not after the law of carnal commandments, but after the power of an endless life. Melchizedek, very interesting character. We'll look at that a little deeper here later, Lord willing. Hebrews 9.10, once again, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So, I'm just trying to pump out some information here. Lots of verses that use the word carnal. It gives us a little bit of a spectrum of how carnal is used in the Bible. So when we look at carnal in the Old Testament, it always is tied directly to fornication or adultery. But when we look in the New Testament, we find that carnality applies much more broadly to our flesh. 
It applies to our flesh. And you look at interesting passages there like we read in Romans 15, where the Gentile believers were told that they had a duty to minister to the saints in Jerusalem in carnal things. That means they had a duty to help them with the fleshly physical needs because the truth is as long as you're alive i don't care how spiritual you are uh, you're going to have carnal needs you're going to need food you might go wild without food but you're going to need food you're going to need water you're going to need clothing i don't care if the world has taken all theirs off as a christian and we have a duty to wear clothing it's it's what's right we need shelter. you got to have roof over your head. And we have, I mean, just to be practical, is there anybody here at church tonight that did not use a vehicle to get here? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, we have one that walked. So all but one used. We. I wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for carnal things to get here. Worldly, fleshly things like a vehicle, they are very useful. But even if you come without a vehicle, it still took your fleshly body to get here. You use energy, you used your body to get here. And these things are important. So don't get so spiritual to think that you can get by in this life without the carnal. It is a necessary part of life, but interesting nonetheless. These two verses we looked at in Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 16 to 9, and verse 10, speak of carnal command, carnal commandments and carnal ordinances. This is another very interesting thing to look at. Carnal commandments, carnal ordinances. What is that talking about? It said there that whenever uh, Melchizedek came and then Christ came after he, the Bible talking about that being the result of a carnal commandment. Christ came about through carnal commandments. It was through the law that was given to mankind that applies to the carnal. When you look at the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, those things apply to the carnal. They apply to the flesh and they point at our body and our lives and show us our sin. Carnal ordinances in the tabernacle. When the tabernacle was set up, they had all the ordinance by which they lived by to set up the tabernacle. Yet all these things dealt with the flesh, but they were a picture of spiritual things. So when we look at the carnal, all that, when we look at the carnal, it pictures the physical uh, it, it pictures the spiritual. You look at the physical and you get a picture of spiritual things. The tabernacle was a carnal thing. It was a physical building that was built. Those skins that they used as a covering on the tabernacle, over time, they wore out. Why? They are carnal. But it was there as a picture of something that is eternal. The true tabernacle in heaven. The priesthood and the carnal commandments was a physical thing. Those priests that walked the earth all died, and they're no longer here. They picture an eternal priesthood that began with Melchizedek, who had no father and no mother, no beginning and no ending. You look at Melchizedek. When he came, he showed up, and the first thing he did is he brought bread and wine to Abraham when he came back from the battle a picture of the eternal priest who would one day come again in fact he's the same one it was Jesus incarnate and Jesus showed up in the New Testament and he said this do in remembrance of me speaking of what when he gave once again he brought two things he brought the bread and he brought the cup what was the bread in the cup? It was his body that was broken for you and I. And he brought the cup, the wine, which was his blood that was shed to pay for sin. But the carnal, a picture of the spiritual. So, here we are, carnal human beings. We live in a body that is the flesh. It is a carnal thing. But it is here is a picture of the real thing. Better be careful what we have our focus on and we don't get our focus all on 
the physical on the carnal and miss out on the spiritual. But carnal, the book of Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. So when we looked in the Old Testament, we saw carnality as a picture of our physical relationship in marriage or as sinful when it's outside of marriage. But then, in the New Testament, when we get to Romans chapter 7, it speaks of carnality here once again, but let's look at what it actually says in Romans 7, 1. It says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So here we see in the New Testament, fixing to read about carnal in this chapter once again but it starts out introducing the physical as a picture of the spiritual and it takes here and very plainly God talks about how a woman when she is divorced from her husband and remarries while her first husband is still alive that it is adultery and what we see through this is that us as Christians because the physical is a picture of the spiritual. That we as Christians, when you are born again, we still live in a physical body that's necessary for life. But when we sin and when we follow the flesh, that is unfaithfulness to God. We become partaker of the same sin of adultery and fornication that we read about in the Old Testament. This is what Brother Rich preached on when we are talking about the, um, the uh, man that was jealous of his wife and took her before the tabernacle. God is also jealous of us, and when we partake in sin as a Christian in the flesh, it is spiritual adultery before God. And we know how damaging... Physical adultery is to a relationship, yet somehow we look at our relationship is with God and we look at His mercy and have somehow decided that when we sin against God, it's not near as big a deal as when our spouse sins against us. I tell you, it's the other way around. Carnality in a Christian. This is why, and Romans 7 is a, a powerful thing to look at when you start out, but you back up a chapter, Romans chapter 6, and that is why we read words like this. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid that we continue in sin. Is there grace? Yes. Does that make my sin okay? No. The Bible even says where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And Paul talked about, well, by my sin, grace abounds even more. Is Sounds pretty wonderful to get a lot of grace, but... ah. Uh, how are you on carnality? I'm. How did I get here on this message? Well, the Lord's been convicting me of my carnality as a Christian. And of the little things I let through that just aren't a big deal. Well, they're not a big deal to me. But they're a big deal to God. And we're called... We're, we're called to die to the flesh. Romans chapter 6. I don't, I don't know how, how better to say it than what God says in His Word. 
Verse 2 of Romans 6 says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead, dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth ye should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. When you read the next chapter and it talks about the woman being released from her husband, what brought that release? Death is what brought the release. We are bound to the law because of sin and it drives us to death because <laughs> we can't keep it. But when you call upon Jesus Christ to save you and you put your faith in Him, He saves you and then the Bible says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him. It is a done deal. You move up just a little bit to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 10. It says, and if Christ be in you, the body is what? Dead. That's the flesh. That's the carnal you. The Bible says the body is dead because of sin, and but the spirit is life because of righteousness. God makes us alive and He puts His Spirit within us, births a new creature within us, and now we die to sin. But it doesn't seem like I'm very dead. And that's why verse number 11 of Romans 6 tells us, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sometimes it doesn't seem like you're saved, and sometimes it doesn't feel like the body's dead. But the Bible says to reckon it to be true. That's when you take, yeah, that's when you cash the check. That's when you put it in the bank. That's when you go and say, God, I trust your word. I believe what you say. Whatsoever that's not a sin, uh, whatsoever is not a faith is sin, the Bible says. If you go by how you feel, you're not going to do so well as a Christian. In fact, you won't, uh, you won't make it anywhere at all. It's sinful once again. We've got to get back to what the Bible says and believe the word of God. The Bible says, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Die to it. Paul said, I die daily. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Why? Because you're dead. Don't let it reign. Don't let it have rule. It's a dangerous thing. When you go to the James chapter 1, verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse number 12. The Bible tells us here, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. What is lust? It's the desires of the flesh, specifically carnal desires. Look it up. Carnal. It's the flesh is the source of it. Why do I lust? Why am I tempted? Because of my flesh. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Don't err. Don't be ruled by your flesh and ruled by sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 13 of Romans 6, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, 
but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I know a little about sin. I know a little bit about being ruled by the flesh. I know what failure is, and I know what falling is. I've cried out to God so many times for His deliverance. And I remember as a young man, serving the Lord, struggling with sin. And I had to go back to Romans chapter 6. And God convicted me and I began to, I took a note card and I wrote out Romans 6, 1. And wrote the whole verse out. And I put it in my pocket. And when I was tempted, I would get out that card and I would read that verse. And oh, I was tempted a lot so it didn't take me very long that I didn't need to get the card out anymore. Had it memorized, Romans 6, 1. Well, that's great. Then... I wrote down Romans 6, 2 and put it all on a card and I stuck that one in my pocket. And then when I was tempted, I would recall Romans 6, 1 and go through that. And then I'd pull out Romans 6, 2 and I would read that. And then it didn't take very long. I didn't need that card anymore either. Could go right through it. Then I got another card and I wrote out Romans 6, 3 and put it in my pocket. And when I was tempted, then it was Romans 6, 1 and Romans 6, 2 and pull out the card to get Romans 6, 3. And I worked my way through and had almost the entire chapter memorized and still didn't find victory. Powerful, wonderful verses, but didn't find victory. I knew these very important words. Romans 6, verse 6, to know. Romans 6.11, to reckon. Romans 6.13, to yield. Those three powerful things, no reckon and yield. Right there is the key for victory. Had it all in my head, but could not find victory until I learned. In verse 18, I'm sorry, back up just a little bit. Uh, um, Verse 16, where the Bible says this, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which has delivered you. I learned something one day, because I had prayed so many times for God's victory in my life, and I was waiting for the day praying for victory when I wouldn't be tempted anymore. But I learned something. The temptation didn't stop. But I learned that just because I was tempted didn't mean that I had to say yes. But I had, at that point, a choice that I never had when I was lost. See, a lost man, when sin knocks at his door and temptation comes... There's only one thing to do. Follow that leash just like a dog on a leash and you follow wherever the devil yanks you around because this old flesh, that's its servant of sin. We have one master. And when the devil yanks, that's where we go. And it's just like a dog. (laughs) You might let your dog run around on the leash and you'll just follow him and let him run wherever he wants and that dog might think that he's free for a while. But the truth is, You've got the leash the whole time. And the devil has got your leash. If you're lost today, the devil's got your leash. You might feel like you're running around having a good time. Oh, he'll he'll play with you. Like them new leashes now, they got a little deal in your hand, and you push the button, and it lets that dog just kind of run out there on a cable. But then as soon as they let over the, they go that button, that thing locks up, and you got them right there. And that's how it is as a lost man. But I didn't realize... And when God saved me, that I had a new master. And even though the temptation still came, I didn't have to say yes anymore. I could say no to sin. I had the privilege to say no to sin. And some people, they don't know that they can say no. (laughs) Christians, they don't know that they can say no to sin. But it's not just a matter of saying no to sin. I learned something else. I couldn't say no to sin without saying yes to God. Verse 16, Know ye not 
that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I had a choice who I was going to yield to. And at that point I could yield to God or I could yield to the flesh. On one side I was serving death and on the other side I had the choice to serve life. Are you being ruled by your carnal flesh? Every time it knocks on your door, are you just following wherever it says? Or have you as a Christian learned that you have the choice, you have the power to say no to sin if you'll say yes to God? What a powerful, victorious thing. God taught me this. I mean, turn my life around. You talk about an amazing thing. But you know what? That's been several years ago. Not ten years, but over twenty years ago. I know that's not very much for some of y'all here, but it still seems like quite a bit to me. But to some of you that are younger, that seems like a really long time. But you know what happens? This is what the Lord's been convicting me about as a Christian. That God taught me all this years ago. And gave me victory in so many areas, but as time has gone by, somehow we just kind of sink back into our old ways. And little by little, the flesh begins to creep in. And what do you know? Before long, we find ourselves back to serving the same old flesh we used to serve. But we got to realize that sin is serious. Carnal Carnality in the life of a Christian is a serious thing before God. God lays that out real plain in his first examples of carnality. But then as we look in the New Testament, it'd be nice if we could just get rid of this body, have our new glorified body, and just live a wonderful Christian life. It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it, Brother Edge? But as long as you're alive, you're going to live in this old flesh. But don't get used to it. We can't afford to make excuses for it. And we got to realize when we sin, though it may not seem like a big deal to you, go back to the Word of God and you're going to realize real quick it's a big deal to God. That's why He gave so much to save you from it. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little sins that get in there and wear you down and will destroy you as a Christian. And when you step out to do something for God, get ready for the battle to come. And the devil starts fighting, and before you know it, he'll get you. So his sins, watch out for carnality in your life as a Christian. Watch out for carnality and get back to the basics. Know the truth. You're dead in Christ. You've been crucified with him if you're saved. Number two, reckon it to be true. That is, you take it by faith. You don't feel too dead, uh, but take it by faith and do what Paul said, I die daily. And then number three, yield yourself as an instrument of righteousness. That means yield to the Lord. Stop yielding to sin. You don't have to. Yield to Him and be obedient. hope this somehow be a blessing to you. Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name. All the precious Stretch your arms and poke your neighbor in the eye and we'll be seated and take prayer requests. Why don't you want to bring the prayer request up here to me? Um.